Sarah Schneewind, and I'm a professor in the Department of History. I was dissatisfied with the book, the textbook that we were using for a survey class that I teach every fall. Not because it isn't good, it's good. It was written by two of the top scholars in the field. Um, but it didn't fit with my way of thinking, and so um, it, the course wasn't as coherent as it could have been because the students were learning one set of things from the textbook and a different set of things from lecture. And I even felt that I had to kind of fight against the textbook at certain points. And so that was getting very frustrating for me, for the TAs, and also for the students. Um, I also wanted something that would be cheaper. The textbook that we were using was, it, it was just ridiculously expensive, even if students bought it used, and even if they bought only the chunk that they needed for that fall quarter, it was still way too much money. And I, all, I had students every quarter who just couldn't afford it, and I would give them old copies that I had, but that's not a good way to proceed. I mean, it was ridiculous. Um, but the third thing was that I, I, I could have written a textbook and published it myself, but I really didn't want a publisher pushing me around. I didn't want somebody telling me, you have to have exactly this many words per chapter, and you need to have these sections, and you need to retain this type of voice, or have bo text boxes, or whatever it was. I wanted to make those decisions. I wanted total autonomy. And I couldn't have gotten that if I had gone with a textbook publisher. Well, not, I haven't done that much, honestly. We, on Facebook, we have groups of scholars, uh, which are quite large. So there's one for Koreanists, uh, and, and I'm very grateful to the Koreanists uh, because they've been answering my questions <laughs> year after year as I try to teach uh, material in Korea, which is not my specialty. There's a group for Japanologists, same thing. They've answered questions for me, although I had a little bit more background in that before I started teaching the course. In fact, we only added Korea to the course a few years ago, so I was learning that you know, as I went along. And then we have a group for Sinologists. Sinology means the study of China. And so I posted the textbook in those three groups and got a lot of a lot of interest that way. Most of those people teach a similar course um, or they need to know that background for their own work. Um, and I obviously have done a lot of spade work of pulling scholarship together and so on. So that's basically all I've done in terms of promotion. And then we, you know, I, I used an earlier version, the draft version, when I taught this course, HILE 10, last fall. And my colleague, Micah Muscolino, who's teaching the course this fall, is using the textbook again this fall. The first thing that I had to do was to write this textbook. And for some of that, I had to do quite a lot of new reading, especially because a lot of new Korean archaeology had come out, um, you know, just in the last few years. And so I spent quite a lot of time reading things that I had not read before or that I had only glanced at so that I could say a little bit in lecture. So some of the material is, is brand new to me. Another portion of the material, however, stems from lectures, some of which I have been giving in one form or another for quite a while. I started teaching in 1999, and um, even at that point, I was teaching classes on ancient China, medieval China, and ancient and medieval Japan. And so I had some material that I had been reworking, you know, for multiple years in different ways for lectures that I could use. 
The problem with that, however, was that my lectures were not footnoted. Or even if they had been footnoted, you know, back in 1999, by the time I had reworked them over multiple years, there was really no more footnotes. And so the footnotage, some of it I was able to reconstruct, but the footnoting in the textbook is pretty uneven because the new stuff that I was just reading, I could footnote obsessively, you know, exactly which article and which book and which page, but the old stuff, there was just no way I could do that. And so I have some general statements that say, you know, much of this chapter was based on these books, um, but then I have some very specific footnotes. So that's really kind of a mess. Um, however, I will say that it's a textbook and the standard of footnoting for textbooks is quite low, precisely because by the time people get around to reading them, to writing them, they already just know a lot of stuff in their heads. And so the footnotes have, have kind of dropped out of their range of vision anyway. So I don't feel too bad about that, but it, it was, you know, if I had known when I graduated that I was going to write this textbook eventually, I would have footnoted all my lectures over the course of the years, but you know, nobody knows that. And so anyway, so that was one thing. Um, another thing that I did was to get feedback from readers. So one set of readers was my own students and my TAs uh, last fall. They would write to me or come into office hours and say, you know, what does this really mean? I don't understand this sentence. Um, and so then I could try to clarify those things or maybe bigger than what is this whole uh, section about? Although honestly, I didn't get that much of that feedback. Um, and then, so that was one set of readers. That was very useful. Of course, they caught all my typos too. Um, then I sent it out to two, I would call them general readers. And they were kind of at opposite ends of life, but neither of them was an expert in East Asian history, not even close. One was a high school student in San Diego who had contacted me and wanted to do some reading over the summer, I think like last year or something. And so, you know, we chatted and I gave her some stuff to read, but I said, you know, I'm gonna be writing this textbook and it would be super helpful if you would give that a read. So she read a number of the chapters uh, as, a, as, as I was producing them or as she had time to read them and gave me feedback on, again, what was not clear, what seemed interesting, what seemed boring, you know, et cetera. And then the other person at the other end of the life was of life was my dad, who was also not in the Asia field at all. Um, in fact, every time I speak Chinese, my mother just starts laughing because she can't believe that those weird sounds are coming out of her daughter's mouth. So my dad basically knows about Asia what I have told him. And so he read a number of the chapters for me. Um, again, to say, this is confusing, what are you talking about here, or whatever, so that was useful. The third set of readers I had was experts in the various fields. So there are some uh, fields either of Chinese history, which are a lot earlier than what I specialize in. The, my field of specialization starts you know, 150 years after this textbook ends, actually. So it, it's all, I'm not a specialist in any of it. Um, and then uh, a couple of the Japan chapters, I think I had people read, or I would, again, I'm always asking my friends in other, you know, in other subfields for help, for suggestions to answer questions and so on. So I got a lot of help from outside experts, uh, basically, out of the goodness of their heart or because they've been my friend for a long time and I've been asking them questions for a long time. So that was really important was getting that reader, getting those readers in, you know, all along the way, different versions and so on, because then I could be relatively confident by the time we issued it that it was more or less comprehensible and more or less correct. part of my process was 
I sent it to you, Allegra. <laughs> that was the next part of my process. And then, you know, having you be able to do the crazy work of putting the PDFs together, I just couldn't handle that. I've never been able to do that. And so when I did it for class, I just issued it chapter by chapter on canvas. And of course the bookstore could, you know, print, print the whole thing out. Um, so I couldn't have managed that PDF, the putting together of the PDF. So having you do that was super helpful. The other super helpful thing was that you really pushed me at the end. Oh, I thought of something else too. That you really pushed me at the end to put in more color illustrations. Now I was reluctant to do that partly because I was lazy, but partly because I deeply, deeply believe that students should print this thing out. In order to read a book properly, you must have a hard copy. I don't care what anybody says. And so with that hard copy, you can write on it, you can hold two places open at once, you can flip forward and backwards, you can put sticky notes all over it, you can fold it down. Um, you can scribble your thoughts. That's, that kind of interaction with a book is really, really important. And so since obviously I don't want students to have to pay to print out color illustrations, that would undermine the whole point of it being cheap. By the way, to print it out without color, 13 or 14 bucks. I mean, that is a price that I think students should be able, should be willing to pay for a textbook that's going to get them through an entire quarter. Of course, I also have a course pack. Um, so I went to the, so then the other thing was that you, I had to get permissions for the illustrations that I did have. That would have been sheer hell, except that I was able to hire this very bright graduate student to manage that for me. Another thing where I got help in production was my original maps, uh, throughout the whole thing, I, I printed out a blank map and I marked it up myself using like a magic marker. And so they were pretty hairy looking. They were pretty homemade looking. And um, an undergraduate volunteered to help me make maps that looked better. The information on them wasn't any better, I want to stress. It's just they, it, he did it in printing instead of in my handwritten scrawl. Um, but, but because I did the maps myself, that saved another permission step. And it also meant that what was on the map was exactly and only the information that students needed to follow my text. And I was able to keep the scale of the map the same um, from one chapter to the next so that students could more easily compare maps. Often in textbooks you see they'll zoom out, they'll zoom in, and you know the maps don't look the same, they don't mark the same rivers, and so it's, it, it's not really that helpful. So I wanted it to be really uniform. Um, so I got some help from students um, on the permission side and on the map side. And then, and then so the last thing to say about that is that after, I, after you kind of bullied me into putting in more pretty pictures, I went to the site for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And some of, almost all of their objects now are in the public domain. So that meant that I could just snip them using the snip function on my computer, which my kid showed me a few years ago, which is my favorite thing ever. Um, I could just snip them, stick them in there, say public domain, thank the Metropolitan, and that was, it turned out to be pretty easy. Now, getting the pages to align, oh, this was another headache. I forgot about this. Before I sent you the final version, I did spend quite some hours putting those illustrations in, putting in the captions, and then making sure that the text was going to break at a at a good point, and that you know where I had a large illustration, you know then I would have to manipulate it differently from if I had like four little small things. Um, that was a headache, but uh, that was something that I really wanted to do myself. I 
didn't want to turn that over to anybody else because I care quite a lot about how my pages look when they're laid out. And so I knew I wasn't going to like anything that anybody else did. And again, the open access allowed me to keep control of that particular part of the process as well. Okay, so um, I was fortunate enough to have a TA who had TA'd for me two years in a row. I was teaching the course both those, both those falls. And so he had, uh, he was able to compare student understanding when they were using the other textbook and when they were using my draft textbook. And as I had intended, the course, the students experienced the course as being much more coherent because I was referring to things in lecture, probably inadvertently in the exact same words <laughs> that I had used in the textbook. Even though I, didn't, I don't go over the exact same material, I'm referring to things. Um, I can, well, that's a whole nother thing about the open access, I guess. Uh, but anyway, he, he um, thought that the students were having a much better experience with it. And students also responded in ways that let me know that, okay, it's the whole course is hanging together better now. Um, and that, so that was really the key thing for me. I also didn't get a lot of bitterness about how much the damn textbook cost, which was, you know, as you know, another thing that I was, that I was aiming for. In terms of my peers, um, the response when I posted this thing was, I mean, it's definitely the most popular that I've ever been on Facebook in my whole life, and I don't expect to ever reach those heights again. Um, people were really thrilled about it because there really hasn't been something that's quite like this, especially something that covers all three countries, this period of time, that takes antiquity seriously. Often textbooks, even if they cover all of history, they kind of focus on the modern, like what everybody really cares about is the modern, whereas I don't care about the modern at all. And my course doesn't, my course stops at 1200 AD. Um, so there's, you know, it's taken, the earlier period is taken more seriously. And of course, my colleagues, just like me, have students who have no money. And so they're very happy to have an open access textbook that they can use. Um, and I, I've been on my e-scholarship statistics, uh, I, I, I had 2,111 uh, views or something on this uh, textbook in the last month since, since you posted it. And um, again, I, I'm never going to attain that on anything that I write that's based on my own actual re research. So I would say overall, the response numerically has been very good. And then those colleagues who started reading the book um, have been really jazzed about it. Of course, those who weren't jazzed about it probably didn't write and tell me. But um, you know, that's, that's always nice. That's always nice to see. So I would say the response has been quite good. Okay, I've thought about this a lot, Allegra. In fact, I came up with some elaborate scheme to fix it. And then I realized, dude, this is not my job. Um, but here's the thing. And there, there are things, we have to separate out textbooks from primary research. So with textbooks specifically and only, a lot of people write textbooks because they need money. They've got three kids that are going to college, they've reached a certain level in middle age where they have the broad view you know, that it takes to write a textbook and they're being paid diddly squat because this is academia and they need the money. So for those kind of people writing a textbook, open access is never gonna work for them. 
the reason I could do it is I'm a full professor now and my kid has graduated. And actually, my kid is now making more money than I am this year uh, because I'm on half salary. And so she's literally making more than me. So I'm in a different stage of life. I don't need that money. I want autonomy more than I need more money. Um, so that's part of the problem with textbooks. Um, the, the problem for primary research is different because, you know, we don't get paid to do our primary research anyway. That, that kind of publishing never amounts to much for most people, um, certainly in history. Um, the problem there is that is precisely the flip side of this autonomy issue. And that is, my textbook is not double blind peer reviewed. Um, any article that I issued open access would need to be double blind peer reviewed in a very, but in a very serious way that was overseen by some kind of body that the people within, people within universities um, who are reviewing people's personnel files could trust. You know, the, the university essentially outsources one level of uh, reviewing personnel files by assuring that people are publishing in reputable journals. Of course, we're also the ones who work for the reputable journals, right, for no money. Um, but that, that means there's kind of a, there's a check right and there's money that the that the university doesn't have to put into reviewing its own people because they've gone through they're being published in this way so i think that in order to really succeed open access publishing is going to have to come up with uh ways to do that that means that you either need very specialized open access journals that fulfill all those same kinds of requirements of double blind peer reviewing and serious editing and so on. Um, or that you're gonna need to have a body, you, Allegra, would need to have um, a, a set of editors working with you in the different fields who could hire, you know, not hire, who could tap, <laughs> send pleading emails to, uh, you know, good people in the field to do the double blind peer reviewing process. I think that's the basic problem. I think I've already answered that question. It's this, what the, the university needs to work out some way to, and again, now this is different for textbooks and, and uh, original research also. Although of course, I mean, where you draw that line is a little unclear, but um, for, for us, writing a textbook doesn't count for squat in our files. Um, so, and there's really nothing the university can do about that, except, and, and, this is, and this is why I was able to do it. John Moore gave me $4,000. The dean and the dean and my department together made up the other $4,000. That's $8,000. That bought me out of a course, one course. That meant that the time that I would have spent teaching that course, I could put into writing this textbook so that it didn't completely undermine my effort to stay on track with my own research. Since, as I said, this, the textbook doesn't count for squat. So I would say that the university, if it's serious about encouraging faculty members to write textbooks specifically that are open access and hence are free for our students, are at the quality that we want, fit in with our courses and all that other stuff, then the university should, should make an effort to buy out, you know, one course or how, whatever it's going to take for a person to write that, write that textbook, which is the only reason I could do it. So I would like to thank 
John Moore and uh, Dean Della Coletta and my department chair at that time was Pamela Radcliffe, they believed in this project. I mean, they believed in it because I did a damn good job of selling it. It was not dead easy, right? But they believed in the project and they therefore supported me and so I was able to do it. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to do it because our reward comes from our own research only in the personnel system. I don't, and I don't think it would be right to change that because we're a research university. That's what we do. We research. Um, yeah, so I, I think buying people out of courses is, and, and they still, you know, it's still, I mean, it's not like that was all it took, right? Mm -hmm. Buying me out of one course, that would mean 11 weeks. It took me a lot longer than 11 weeks to do this thing. But that was enough so that I was willing to, you know, sacrifice, again, because of the financial position I was in, because I was, had just been made full professor. I didn't have to, you know, I wasn't struggling for tenure. I wasn't struggling for full professor. Um, and I want to run my life so that I'm doing what the hell I want and not what somebody else tells me I should be doing, you know, uh, but no, I don't think the university should change that in terms of personnel files.